As I reflect, I find perspective They're in the best and worst days of this life Hi and welcome to Victory Church Online. It's so good that you've decided to spend part of your Sunday with us. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's been so encouraging of our online content. The people who have taken the time to write to us either through text or email or make a phone call just to say how much they appreciate what we are doing. You know, the move to coming online was very daunting for all of us and particularly for us as a staff as we had to learn uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, even watching myself week in, week out, and watching our other staff members, it's funny all the things and mannerisms which you pick up. And that's what's made all your encouragement uh, to us so important and special. And so we really do thank you for those people that have expressed so much support to us. We've really tried to make these broadcasts as authentic and real for the people of Bendigo as we can. One of the great things has been those people that regularly attend church who have been able to watch and also those who don't regularly attend church who have now started tuning in every week. And if that's you, we're so glad that you're choosing once again to be a part of what we do at Victory. I want to say a huge thank you to my staff for their dedication and willingness to change and adapt over this season. Uh, and church, we're so blessed. We have a great staff of good people that want to serve you and bless you over this time and period. We're currently working on our meetings in what our meetings in person will look like and uh, so excited to be uh, see the horizon that we'll be able to meet together soon as we have more details and uh, as the end towards the end of this month we will have those up for you and email people on how you can participate in those i did want to say a huge thank you also for your generous giving over this period uh, church you've just been fantastic and just consistent and that's really given us the hope that post covid 19 uh, that the church can envision what the future will look like free from financial restraint. As always, we will be taking up an offering today and you have, you have the details on your screen on how you can do that. And we will be taking communion. So if you haven't prepared that, maybe pause now and you can prepare that. Don't forget, we're doing a series on faith at the moment. My wife's going to be speaking today a great message. We really hope you enjoy today's service as you have all the others. God bless you and have a great Sunday. And I search the world But he couldn't feel me Man's empty praise Treasure the things But never enough And you came along And put me back together now every desire is now satisfied Hearing you love Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you There's nothing Nothing is better than you To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, oh you've seen it all and you still call me friend, oh the God of the mountain, the God of the mountain, it's the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again
church this Sunday. Hey, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Steph and I'm just here to give a real quick communion message. So why don't we open up our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53 verses 3 to 5 and it says this, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Hey church, I feel like in, ch in church, we hear a lot of communion and we know about Christ and we know that what he did for us and we know the meaning behind the cross. But do we really think about it though? Do we really spend a moment with God and not just think, oh yeah, it's another Sunday. I know what Christ did for me. Like I know it kind of thing. And we can get into this routine where we kind of start taking it for granted. But church, can I remind you, let's 
take a moment with God and actually sit there and thank him for what he has done and not just taking a memory but having a moment with God church let's just not take this as head knowledge but heart knowledge as well I mean aren't you grateful for a king who took your place who died a sinner's death and took your place on that cross I know I am grateful and I, I know that every time that I think about it it brings me to tears that how could anyone ever put their put themselves in my place in all my wrongdoing in all my sin and take that on a cross for me who sacrificed his life for me and hey it says in this scripture that we despised him and he suffered for us and that he brought us peace when it should have been brought for him when he was pure and holy but hey church aren't you grateful for that king aren't you grateful for our king who saved you who saved all of us who loves all of us Hey, God is a good God, but let's not take this for granted. Let's not take a, a memory over a moment with God. Let's thank him and let's spend time with him. I mean, how many times do we go throughout our weeks and actually sit there and thank him and not have any expectation in, in praying or anything like that or, or trying to get something out of it or asking God for our wants or our needs or anything like that. How many times do we sit there and we are thankful for who God is and not what he's about to do for us. And hey, let's be let's be kind of selfless in this moment and not think about ourselves, but let's think about what a great, amazing God that we serve. Hey church, I just wanna pray for you. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. God, I thank you so much for today, Lord. I thank you that let this not only be head knowledge, but heart knowledge as well, Lord. Father, I just pray that you would encounter us, Jesus, from wherever we may be, Lord. Father, I thank you for who you are, God. I thank you that you sent your son on the cross for us, Lord. That even people mocked him and spat on him and he was such, it was such a brutal murder, God. Father, I thank you that you did it for us, Lord. I thank you that you saved us, redeemed us and called us loved, Lord. Amen. Thanks, church. Hi Church, welcome to Church Online. And today, once again, we're in a shed out at the Heather's Farm, which makes it pretty cool. I think that's a pretty cool way of preaching today. I want you to do something for me today um, on purpose. We're right in the middle of a faith series and I just felt that maybe some of you need to get out of your PJs. I'm not talking about your physical PJs, you can stay in your PJs if you want to, but I'm talking about your spiritual PJs. I wonder if you could jump off the couch for me or wherever you happen to be. You might be in bed watching this or you might be out and about, I don't know. But I just want you for a minute to actually stand up where you are, reach out to God and I wanna pray for you. I feel like as you listen to me today that God's gonna actually bring a shift in your own heart and you're actually gonna get ready to step out of PJ mode into army boot mode. Why don't you pray with me? Father, I thank you today for every person who's listening to the sound of my voice that you wanna speak into their heart from your Word. I thank you, your Word is powerful and it's actually, it's not gonna return void. It's gonna bring a great return as your, as your Word sows seed into people's hearts today. I pray for an impartation of faith, expectation and supernatural miracles today. I pray wherever anyone is today that as they take off their spiritual pyjamas or the trackies that they've been wearing over their soul, I pray today that there'll be a sense that there's a shift happening in their own lives. In Jesus' Name, Amen. As I prayed, we're actually in a season of, uh, of doing three or four weeks on faith. And Steve preached last week on faith and he's gonna be preaching again next week on faith. And I'm doing the same today. And when Steve first said that he wanted to do this series on faith, I actually felt the physical sensation of taking off my spiritual PJs and putting something on that was more appropriate to fighting in a spirit of faith. I actually felt God take me to this um, chapter in the Bible, Luke chapter seven. And I'm gonna sit there for a little while today. One of the things we do as a family is 
um, when we do devotions, we don't do it often, maybe once or twice a week. I, we always ask this question and it's the question, what stood out to you the most? And we just simply ask our kids and, and, and one another, just pick one thing as you're listening, listen for one thing that stood out to you that you could share with the family. And anytime we have visitors over and we happen to do a devotion, we do the same. We just say, hey, pick out one thing that stood out to you. And I want you to do the same today. As I'm reading, and you might even wanna pause and reread it, just so that you can find one thing. And I would be praying, in, in, I've been praying in my heart as you're listening that God will speak to you personally from this chapter. And it might not even be what I'm preaching on. It might be something else, but I believe God can speak to you just one thing that's a takeaway from this passage. It's found in Luke chapter 7. We find in Luke chapter 6, Luke's been describing this interesting scenario where Jesus has been out on the hillside and it's actually the Sermon on the Mount and he's been teaching the crowds and he's also been teaching the disciples. Chapter 6 is also where he chose his 12 disciples out of the followers that have been coming to him. All the crowds that have been coming to him have heard about him and they've come from all over that region. So there's a lot of them. And they've come because they heard that Jesus is performing miracles and doing miracles of healing and incredible deliverances. And it says in chapter 6 verse 16 that everyone wanted to touch Him and everyone that He touched was healed. So everyone is getting a healing. Everyone's getting a miracle. And so He's coming out of that environment where He's been speaking a lot, teaching a lot, performing miracles, back to Capernaum, which has become His home base, like the base of His operations. He's been travelling in and out of villages and He's going to be spending the next three years travelling back and forth. And Capernaum has become the centre. He's base. So he's coming back into Capernaum and we pick up from there. In verse one, it says, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer or a Roman centurion was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he, d he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. But Jesus, just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends, officer sent some friends to say this, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honour. I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word, just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I was, I'm under the authority of a superior officer and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. As, and if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, He was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following Him, He said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. I wonder what stood out to you from that passage. There's a few things that stand out to me. I notice there's a few different characters in this story. We have Jesus, obviously, and the whole book, the Gospels are all about Jesus. And if you wanna to get to know Jesus, I encourage you just read the Gospels over and over again and get to know the character of Jesus. There's also a crowd following Him. There's people who followed Him into this town. There's also His disciples who are with Him. We have some Jewish elders who've come from the centurion's house and they're engaging in conversation with Jesus. So this story is about a conversation that starts with the elders coming to Jesus, speaking on behalf of the centurion. And then we have the centurion and a slave. Throughout this story, we don't, the, the centurion's not present and neither is the slave. So these elders are actually speaking on behalf of the centurion. We also have um, th this interesting scenario that happens, a conversation between the centurion and the elders, Jewish elders. We've got a conversation between the Jewish elders and Jesus. And then Jesus turns to the crowd and talks to them. And we have all these different scenarios, but there's one thing that actually stood out to me the most. Before I get there, I wanna talk about these different characters. What about the Jews? What, can I, what, what do I notice about these Jews? The Jewish elders have a great respect for this Roman centurion. 
the Romans at the time had taken occupation of the land and there was a lot of animosity between the Jews and the Romans. So I find it unusual in this story that the Jewish elders actually respect the centurion and it's mutual. This centurion soldier has actually invited the elders, the Jewish elders, to go to speak to Jesus on his behalf. There's this mutuality of respect and honour and regard. That's unusual. The, it's interesting that the Jewish elders actually use something to leverage Jesus. They say these words in verse four and five, if anyone deserves it, if anyone deserves it, like this centurion, he loves God's people and he even built our synagogue. Isn't it like us, religion? isn't it like religion to say, hey, look at his good works, he deserves a miracle. Based on who he is and his character and his person, That's what's gonna get His miracle. And we can be the same. We think if we just do certain things, then we have the right to a miracle. We're entitled to something. Then we have the servant, the slave. And what I find really interesting is in that that era, slaves were very common. Nearly every household would have had a servant of of a slave. And as Romans moved across and built their empire, they gathered more and more slaves. This centurion would would have had a number of them. Slaves were considered indispensable, no value. If one died, they just replaced them with another. So I find it unusual in this passage that the centurion regarded this slave with great affection and concern. So much so that they must have been to a doctor and the doctor said, hey, there's nothing else I can do. And he goes a little bit further and he goes and chases down this man who he knows can do something about it. I, I love that he places so much value on the slave. And it says something about the character of this centurion. A centurion would have been someone in in a high position. A centurion is someone who had probably about a hundred soldiers under him. And he was he was probably in the region, he was the main man on the ground, making sure that there was peace, making sure that um, the taxes were collected. So he was considered a very important person for the Romans as well as the Jews. What I find really interesting in this story, more than anything else, about the centurion is he gets authority. He actually understands authority more than even most Christians. And his understanding of authority, understanding that just say the word, it speaks to me. Is that my response to Jesus? In the same way that he responds to his captain in the same way his servants and soldiers respond to his instructions, He's expecting the same of Jesus, but He places Jesus in the place of a captain over Him. He actually shows a great level of humility. But the, other, the one thing that actually stands out to me is none of that. What stood out to me in this story is found in verse nine. It's after the, the centurion has t- said to Jesus, hey, don't even come to my house. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. Just say the word. Jesus' response, When Jesus heard this, He was amazed. When Jesus heard this, He was amazed. It's not very often that you think of God or the Lord Jesus Christ as being amazed at anything. This word is in the Greek is thamazo. It means to marvel, to be amazed and to be caught in wonder. It actually appears in the Gospels a lot, this word thamazo. It actually is something that's used really often when people respond to Jesus, not the other way around. So when Jesus stilled the storm, the disciples turned to Him in amazement, thamazo, in wonder and amazement that He had authority over the storm. It's the same word that, that's spoken of the disciples when they listened to His teaching. They were amazed at His teaching. They were caught in wonder. When people were healed, they were amazed at His ability to, to heal the sick and do miracles. They were caught in wonder and amazement and marvelled at his, his wisdom and His teaching. But there's only two places in the Gospel where Jesus is caught by surprise and shows amazement. You know, God hasn't been caught by surprise by what's happening in 2020. He's not caught by surprise by a pandemic moving across the earth. So what is it about this story where suddenly we find someone who's who's the God of the universe, He's the Creator, He knows everything, He's sovereign, yet He's caught in amazement at something. And Luke actually articulates this word, the mouth, Jesus turns to, to the crowd in amazement. And there's another place in Mark chapter six, exactly the same word, the mouth. In In Luke chapter seven, It's a response to the centurion's faith. It's the faith of this man, such faith leaves Jesus amazed and in wonder. But when we go to chapter six, it's something different that catches Jesus' attention. 
In Mark chapter 6, Jesus has gone back to His original hometown where He grew up. In Mark chapter 6, He's, he's a Nazarite going back to Nazareth. It's where He spent His childhood. It's, it's a smallish town. There's probably only about 500 people there. So most, nearly everybody would know everybody. Jesus often went to the synagogue and spoke in the synagogue. So they would have known Him in the local synagogue. We find ourselves in verse 1, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with His disciples to Nazareth, His hometown. The next Sabbath, He began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard Him were amazed. So they were responding to His teaching and they were amazed. Then they asked this, where did He get all this wisdom and the power to perform miracles? And then they scoffed, He's just a carpenter. He's the son of Mary not even the son of Joseph. Normally they would speak about the father, but they actually diminished it to the son of the mother. And he's just the brother of James and Joseph, who we know, Judas and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honoured everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place His hands on a few sick people and heal them. And He was amazed at their unbelief. Here we find Jesus, that same word, the mauzo. He was amazed at their unbelief. What stands out to me about this word is only twice is Jesus amazed in the Gospel. In every detailed story, only twice is He amazed. And both of them are related to faith. And as we do this series on faith, I wanna ask you this question. If Jesus were to walk into your household today, what would He be amazed at? Would He find a similar type of faith to Luke chapter seven that was shown in the centurion man? Or would He be amazed at your unbelief? What I find interesting as I put these two stories next to each other is, is the people who knew Jesus best the ones who'd spent the most time with Him were the ones who chose not to believe. I've grown up in church all my life. I've been a Christian all my life. I've been around Christians all my life. And there's something about the familiarity of Mark chapter 6 and that story that resonates with me. There's something unusual about a Gentile, Roman centurion who shows a more amazing faith and he doesn't really know Jesus compared to the ones who should know Jesus. I find myself often in my Christian walk, maybe I'm own, I become so familiar with Jesus that He's just a carpenter, just a teacher. Sometimes He's a really good friend. I love the Jesus that can come alongside me and comfort me. I love the Jesus that offers grace when I do the wrong thing. I love the Jesus that actually is the picture of kindness. But what about the Jesus that, that has authority for the situations I'm facing that I've just come to accept? That centurion could have come to Jesus and said, hey, buddy, my slave is sick. Could you come and sit by his bedside? He could have said to him, hey, this guy's going through a valley. Will you walk through the valley with me? But you know what? He appeals to Jesus' authority. He appeals to Jesus' role as a captain and Lord. And there's something about Mark chapter six story that speaks to me about the familiarity where I can sometimes disregard Jesus' Lordship over the situations that I'm facing. I'm asking you church to reconsider the authority Jesus has over the stuff that you are dealing with right now. I, I don't wanna be the person where Jesus walks into my situation and I invite Him in, but then I begin to wrestle with what He's speaking over my life. I want to be the one who says, just say the Word and I'm going to walk in that. I want to be the one who actually responds with amazing faith. But so often I find myself way too familiar with the Jesus that I've walked with all my life. And this story challenges me as someone who should know better, as someone who should know Jesus well, to see past just the teacher, just the friend, which He is, just a kind and gracious man, to someone who has authority in my life. I think we're all about impressing one another. I love that church has changed for a little while because it's taken away all the things that we think impresses God. 
And in Hebrews it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But I wonder if we put some things in our lives that we think pleases God and He says, hey, I'm not interested in that because it's not attached to any form of faith. Without faith, He doesn't say without coming to church every Sunday. He doesn't say without doing your regular devotions. He doesn't say without your generosity, without all those things are good. But if they're not a response to our faith and our trust and our belief in Him, maybe we've got way too familiar. Maybe we're trying to impress Him in the wrong way. I think we're all about impressing one another. We live in a culture that's all about curating a persona and a profile and an ideal of what living should be like. But have we ever thought to curate what does faith look like and what is it that's gonna amaze Him? Genuine heartfelt trust. If you say so, that's what I'll do. If Just say the word and I'll respond to that. You have authority. I genuinely believe there are situations in our lives that Jesus has authority in, but maybe we've been limiting the miracles in our own lives. You see, in Mark chapter 6, I don't think Jesus couldn't do the miracles. He just didn't see the faith that He was looking for. And it can be an awkward conversation when we say, hey, where's your faith? But God places great emphasis on faith and belief and trust. What I love about the centurion though, he doesn't do anything that looks spiritual. He just gets the authority that Jesus has over him. He understands the role of a captain. And I wonder today if you could possibly take off those PJs that I suggested spiritually, strap on your army boots and pick up your shield of faith, dust it off and start responding to the captain in your life. What is it you want me to do that's a response in faith? God, what are you asking me to do as I step out of quarantine? I don't wanna be on the back foot, reticent to come out of where I've been because it's comfortable. I actually want to be on the front foot of what looks like a war, knowing that my captain is going to give me instructions and I want to respond in faith. Just say the word. If you say go, I'll go. If you say come, I'll come. I love that the centurion got that it wasn't just about Jesus responding to what he needed, but he was responding to Jesus' instruction, just say the word. He came under authority, Uh, he got it. And I wonder if my faith, is about a response to His Lordship today. I love the Saviour side of Jesus, that He came to save. But there's also a really important part and it's about, do I trust Him as my Lord? Do I trust Him as my Captain? Will I believe the things that are difficult to believe? The things that make me feel like I just need to scoff. There are things in this Word that don't feel comfortable for me because I like things that are comfortable and make me feel good. But when Jesus says something different in His Word to what makes me feel good, am I willing to say, just say the Word and I'll realign my life to what He says? It's just that one thought today. If Jesus was to walk into this situation, do I want Him to align with my feelings and what I feel about the situation? Or am I willing to amaze Him with my faith? Marvel at my faith. Would He turn to those looking on in my life and say, hey, I've never seen such faith since that centurion. I wonder if there is people in my life and in our church who've missed out on miracles because I've sat in a position of unbelief. But I wanna step into a, a, a space where I actually pursue, chase after a faith that amazes God, where He's not amazed by my unbelief and my need to wrestle with what He's asking of me but He's amazed at my immediate response that comes from a heart of faith, not fear, a heart of faith and not comfort. Familiarity is dangerous. Familiarity is dangerous to my faith. And I wonder today if God can speak into your situation and speak a word and you receive a miracle because your faith amazes Him. Church, I wanna close in prayer. And I want you to do the same as you did at the beginning. I want you to jump up off the couch, maybe reach your hands out. And I'm gonna pray for you today. And I'm gonna pray that Jesus walks into your place today and you respond with faith. Why don't you pray with me? Father, I thank You for every person who's standing ready to say yes in faith. I pray today that God, You will touch every person who can hear my voice 
with a sense of hope and expectation of what You wanna do. I pray for a revelation of authority today, of Lordship. God, I pray for a heart of humility, just like the centurion who understood that he came under Jesus' authority. I thank You that we come under the authority of Your Word today and we respond with a yes. Just say the Word. God, I pray for those who need healing today. Just say the Word. I pray for those who are struggling financially and have been dialoguing and wrestling, wanting You to comfort them as they struggle. But God, I thank You, You have authority over their finances today. That God, You can do a miracle. I pray for those who who are struggling with fear and tentativeness about change ahead. I pray God for a response of faith that amazes You. I pray for a shift today. I pray for those who are struggling in relationships. I thank You, You have authority, that You are Lord of their home. I thank You that families, God, where there's been a tussle of leadership, I thank You, You are the leader, You are the captain, You are Lord. I pray today for Lordship to be, to be something that our whole church comes into a line with, with. You are our captain, You are our Lord. Just say the word. I pray for an impartation of faith that leaves you astounded, marvelling and amazed. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us for Victory Church Online today. If you are impacted by the message of Jesus today or just want to talk to someone, you can contact us through the details that are on the screen now. If you're a part of our Victory Church family and you need support in any way through this season, you can also contact us through the details that are on the screen now. Thank you so much for joining us online for church today. We love you and we're praying for you and we look forward to seeing you online next week.